Minister Farrakhan was getting soft. Minister Farrakhan was selling out. And he knew that Khalid wasn't going to go for that. So Khalid had to go. It's just that simple. Brother Khalid didn't fall out of Minister Farrakhan's good graces until the 90s. And it was when he fell out of the good graces of Minister Farrakhan that we embraced him because we knew what that was like. We saw him, the man who had done so much to support Minister Louis Farrakhan and to help him to build what he established. We saw him now being given the same treatment that we knew <laughs> for years. We were all given orders that we were not to attend Minister Collett's lectures. We were not to provide Minister Collett any security. I didn't believe those orders were from Minister Farrakhan. Those of you whose heads are up the gluteus maximus of Minister Farrakhan, and you want to tell me about Minister Farrakhan, you're talking to a man who's already been where you are. I could not believe that Minister Farrakhan would order security removed from college. So Khalid says to me, brother, Minister Farrakhan is the one who told them not to secure me. And it just knocked me out. I couldn't believe it. Say peace and black power. Welcome to another song at a TV House of Continents production. You already know what it is. We are here with my brother Jabari Osaze at the shrine of Ma'at, and we have a powerful guest today, and he, he go by the name of Eric. Muhammad. A lot of you know who this brother is. He is not a stranger to this information. He's been doing this for years, but I'm going to let him introduce himself to you. Peace to you, my brother Eric Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I'm Minister Eric Muhammad. I am the Atlanta, Georgia representative of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad's temple number 15. I've been a minister and representative of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad for over two decades. And we're there on Dill Avenue on the corner of Metropolitan Parkway. We've been there for 10 years, and we're just doing the work of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. No long introduction, <laughs> just doing the work of the yes. Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Man, I don't know. I mean, I could look at you. You still look like a young little young man, a young man. And I heard the, one of the ministers say, "You eat one meal a day." Let's talk no, about one the new meal every three days. one meal every three days. Let's talk about that nutrition. How how did you make that happen? How was that? Um, you know, that's a work in progress. How did you do that, brother, nutritionally wise? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us mm -hmm. his followers to eat one meal every day once every 24 hours nothing in between except water or coffee he teaches us not to put too much sugar or cream in the coffee is best black and he teaches that once you master one meal every 24 hours you go to one meal every 48 hours once you master one meal every 48 hours then you go to one meal every 72 hours so from 1983 until 1997 i ate one meal a day in 1997 i went to one meal every other day and then in 2006 i went to one meal every three days mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful, brother. And, and what does the meal look like? Is it? Uh, I, I know that because I'm so familiar with people who have been Coffee. followers of um, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. That you're not eating what some people would think you're eating. You're not eating these huge meals full of all the the fried foods and all the sodium and all of the the the, the cholesterol. What does that What does that meal look like? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us 
that the three best foods are navy beans, mm -hmm. bread, and milk. And so I always attempt, I'm not always successful, but I always attempt to incorporate the navy bean, whole wheat bread, toasted through and through with some butter, and good wholesome whole milk. Mm. But he also teaches us that a well-rounded meal, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. The Muslims, we enjoy our fish. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in eating a lot of meat. Mm -hmm. We do eat some meat, but we are not meat lovers. Right. We prefer fish. It's a different type of life the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us. So we enjoy our fish. We enjoy our brown rice. We enjoy our vegetables, our fruits, but the basis of our meal is that navy bean, that bread, and that milk. When I sit down to eat, I want some navy beans, I want some cream of wheat bread, and I want some milk. <laughs> what brought you to the Nation of Islam? How did this start for you? If you could take us back, how did this all start? How did you find your way to the Nation of Islam? When I was 21 years old in 1983, there was a brother who owned a barber shop. He's my mentor, the brother that brought me in and taught me, trained me, and made me a minister. I'm speak of Minister Keith Muhammad in Plainfield, New Jersey. He owned a barber shop. And my cousin went to that barber shop to get his hair cut. And we were hardcore Christians at the time. <laughs> and Minister Keith, he wasn't a minister at the time, but he would be in the barber shop and he would be preaching hard on the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was born in the Nation of Islam during the time of the Messenger and raised in it. Mm. And so my cousin came to me because I was a Bible thumping Christian. And he mentioned to me that this brother Keith was saying some very, very powerful things in the barbershop. And he wanted me to go to the barbershop and debate him. <laughs> so, of course, I took my Jesus-loving, <laughs> Bible-thumping self. And I went to the barbershop to convert this Muslim fella to Jesus. And within five minutes, and if you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Five minutes, he converted me to Islam. Mm, wow. Five minutes, and he used my Bible <laughs> to do so. <laughs> it's been nothing but progress ever since. Mm. Ever since. Let's, let's tarry a little bit more. I want to hear more about what you did when you got to the nation. Where okay. were you? Where? What was the neighborhood like? What kind of work did you I was in Plainfield, New Jersey at the time. And... Uh, I was running a limousine service with my cousin, mm. and Plainfield was your typical black urban, you know, place, for lack of a better term. Uh, I, I wouldn't know how else to describe it. I mean, it was a hood, mm -hmm. you know, like any other hood. Right. And when I say hood, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I just simply mean it was a black hood mm -hmm. you know uh, but I want to say this it wasn't the nation of Islam <laughs> I don't know how else to go into it you when you say how did you come to the nation of Islam well I came to the nation of Islam by meeting a minister of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad by the name of minister Kevin Ali and this was in 2000 mm -hmm. In 1983, I joined the Final Call Incorporated. Mm. That's what I call it. It's not the Nation of Islam. Oh, okay. And very few things... So it wasn't called the Nation of Islam. It was called time. the Nation of Islam. I mean, you can call anything, anything that you want. Mm -hmm. It was not the Nation of Islam. It is not the Nation of Islam. It never has been the Nation of wow. Islam. Okay. It never will be the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is the doctrine and practice of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And Minister Farrakhan's organization has never been that. <clears throat> the Nation of Islam was destroyed in 1975 by 
the messenger's son, Wallace D. Muhammad. And what many of us want to skate past is that his chief helper in the destruction of the nation of Islam was Minister Louis Farrakhan. When people say he's been on the front lines for 60 years, no, he has not been on the front lines for 60 years. He was on the front lines for 20 years from 1955 until 1975. And when the messenger son took over the nation of Islam and destroyed it, the mouthpiece, the national representative of that destroyer, the international representative of that destroyer, the man whose golden tongue articulated the destruction of the nation of Islam is the same man we want to call the leader of the nation of Islam today. I joined his organization because I had no knowledge of what that organization was. I didn't follow the messenger when the messenger was here. So the only nation of Islam I knew, quote unquote, I have to put it in quotes, the only nation of Islam I knew was that movement that was led by Louis Farrakhan. And so I joined it. But from the moment I joined it, I was an outcast. Mm. I was an outcast because the brother who brought me into it was an outcast. He was an outcast because he was born in, raised in, and made by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's leadership, teaching, and guidance. So that's all he knew. And so because of his strong stance on the messenger's teaching, it caused him to, again, be an outcast. And because of my relationship with him, it led to me being an outcast. I never understood why we didn't get along with those who were, quote, unquote, Nation of Islam officials and members. And eventually, it just came to a head. Mm. It came to a head. So, um, when did you become a minister under Minister Louis Farrakhan? That was in 1991. Okay. And again, when I became a minister in 1991, I was not recognized as a minister. Hmm. Isn't that crazy? Right. Damn. Right. Yes. At the time in 1991, when I was made a minister, Minister Keith was running a mosque that was considered renegade. We were pushing the Final Call newspaper. We were sending money to Chicago. We were preaching Minister Louis Farrakhan hard, heavy, and strong, but yet we were considered by the other mosques, those that were quote unquote sanctioned mosques. We were considered renegade. They called us imposters. Mm. <laughs> so when they call us imposters now, I just laugh. You called me an imposter when I was pushing your newspaper. Mm. You called me an imposter when I was preaching your leader. You called me an imposter when I was sending him $500 a month <laughs> for number two poor and I was pushing over a thousand per issue over a thousand newspapers per issue you called me an imposter then mm -hmm. so I don't respect you referring to me as an imposter now as if if I was with Minister Farrakhan, I wouldn't be an imposter. You called me an imposter when I was mm -hmm. with Minister Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And you called me an imposter when I was with Minister Farrakhan because I wouldn't bend over and grab my ankles and accept the BS that you were running in the name of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan. Mm. So when all of this was going down, my brother, where was Dr. Khalid Muhammad? Was he in the nation at that time? Yes, indeed. Minister Khalid at that time was in the good graces mm -hmm. of Minister Louis Farrakhan. And being in the good graces of Minister Louis Farrakhan, he was not 
undergoing the type of ill treatment that many of those of us who were standing strong on the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he wasn't going through that. He was in Minister Farrakhan's good graces. Brother Khaled didn't fall out of Minister Farrakhan's good graces until the 90s. And it was when he fell out of the good graces of Minister Farrakhan that we embraced him because we knew what that was like. Mm. We saw him, the man who had done so much to support Minister Louis Farrakhan and to help him to build what he established. We saw him now being given the same treatment that we knew <laughs> for years. And so quite naturally, we embrace the brother. Mm -hmm. could, could you, uh, here's a question. I, now, uh, this, is, this is fascinating. You're saying that you actually considered a reg renegade even when you were under the dictates in many ways of, of Louis Farrakhan. How, how, how did that happen? How did it occur? How long was, did, that, uh, did that happen? I, I can only imagine what that must have felt like. Yes. It was from 1983 all the way until 1996. Wow. There was a brief period uh, just before the Million Man March. Just before the Million Man March, Minister Farrakhan gave instructions that those of us who were running renegade mosques were to be brought into the fold. Mm. We were in New Jersey at the time, and the state minister was Minister Qadir Muhammad, who's in Washington, D.C., last I heard. And he was given instructions by Minister Farrakhan to bring the several, quote, renegade, end quote, mosques in New Jersey into the fold. Mm. And so there was a brief period from just before the Million Man March until May of 1996 that I was actually recognized and sanctioned as a minister of Minister Louis Farrakhan. But due to my refusal to disassociate myself from Minister Khaled, we were all given orders that we were not to attend Minister Khaled's lectures, we were not to provide Minister Khaled any security. And I was one of the few who bucked those orders. And remarkably, I didn't believe that they were from, they meaning the orders, I didn't believe those orders were from Minister Farrakhan. You have to understand, those of you whose heads are up the gluteus maximus of Minister Farrakhan, and you want to tell me about Minister Farrakhan, you're talking to a man who's already been where you are. My head was further up than yours is now. I could not believe that Minister Farrakhan would order security removed from Khalid. And the, you know what it took to make me believe it? Call it telling me. I invited him to speak in my city. And when he began to question me, I, in my ignorance, mentioned to him that when Minister Farrakhan found out what the other mosques were doing, I'm not kidding. Mm. I'm sitting on the phone with him telling him what Farrakhan is going to do when he finds out about these other Muslims not securing him. So Khalid says to me, brother, Minister Farrakhan is the one who told them not to secure me. And it just knocked me out. I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. So this began my transition away from him because I'm like, I don't get it. I couldn't justify it. I tried to in my mind the same way that those who are with him today, they just justify any and everything he says, any and everything he does. I tried to justify it, but I just couldn't find a justification in my mind. The law of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad is clear. You can't deny Khalid 
for freedom, justice, and equality in the, quote, nation of Islam without bringing him up on charges, finding him guilty of those charges, and assigning him a specific punishment for those charges. There's no such thing as you're in limbo indefinitely. I'm sorry, that just doesn't exist. You say, well, Khalid was guilty of insubordination. You a damn liar. But let's just say you were tr telling the truth. That's 30 days or 90 days, class F maximum. Maximum, 90 days, F class. Day 91, you're right back. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're in C class until you qualify to be back in full standing. There's no such thing as you're indefinitely in limbo. Mm -hmm. What the hell does he think he is? Right. So now, my brother Eric Muhammad, it begins to get interesting now. Why do you suppose Dr. Khalid was suspended for, quote unquote, the speech he did at King College when he learned all of that from the minister? Why do you think the minister went through all that trouble to really sit him down off of that post, brother? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Many don't know. Many are very, very new to this thing called Nation of Islam. Khalid Muhammad's quote, wildness, end quote is a wildness that he got emulating his mentor, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Minister Louis Farrakhan was a bad boy, quote unquote, in the nation of Islam. He had a very, very raw mouth. He had a very, very uh, rough uh, demeanor. I mean, Minister Farrakhan didn't play. In fact, I mean, Old Testament Minister Farrakhan is my dude. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I like it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this New Testament fella that is hugged tight with a cracker, mm. a Christian preacher, and looking like he kissing the cracker in the mouth. That Farrakhan? I can't get with that Farrakhan. So... My answer to your question, long story short, is Khalid Muhammad was nothing but a young Farrakhan. <laughs> As Farrakhan got older and began to mature, you know, he kind of toned down a bit. But he always kept that fire, though. But he kind of toned down a bit. But Khalid was an expression of that young Farrakhan. When Khalid decided to accept Islam, he accepted Islam following after that young, bold, brash, and bodacious Farrakhan, who was a Khalid himself in the 1960s when Khalid fell in love with him. He was a Khalid. Mm -hmm. And so he emulated his mentor. Uh, when he gave that speech at King College, we can do nothing but speculate. We can't get in Minister Farrakhan's mind and say, okay, this is what he was thinking at the time, and we have the proof right here. However, we can look at the moves that Minister Farrakhan was making at that time and the moves that he made subsequent to that time that he never would have been able to make had it not been for him distancing himself from his student, Khalid Muhammad. And so looking at that, Minister Farrakhan was getting soft. Minister Farrakhan was selling out. And he knew that Khalid wasn't going to go for that. So Khalid had to go. It's just that simple. Minister Farrakhan learned from his teacher after the messenger, Wallace D. Muhammad, how to handle Khalid because he studied the way Wallace D. Muhammad handled him. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, in 1975, Wallace D. Muhammad was Farrakhan, and Farrakhan was Khalid. 
And if you look at the playbook of how Wallace handled Farrakhan and why he handled Farrakhan that way, you see exactly why Farrakhan handled Khalid the way he handled Farrakhan. He literally used the same plays that Wallace used on him. He used those same plays on Khalid and for the same reason. Okay. Let's talk about the death of Khalid Muhammad. Do you buy it? where they say he had a brain aneurysm. Did you see any of the reports that came out that our brother Malik Zulu Shabazz brought out from the new Black Panther Party? Did you ever get a chance to, to look at that? Uh, no, no, sir. Okay, so do you buy the um, the death report where they say that, you know, he had a brain aneurysm? I'm, I'm the one that always came out and said, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Even Khalid said, if I was to so much slip on a banana pill, God damn it, the white man did it. <laughs> so he's telling you right there, don't fall for none of that. And when he was in the hospital, he said, make sure you don't tell them who I am. Don't tell them my name. Don't say my name. So um, do you buy the whole thing of him having a brain aneurysm? Absolutely not. Oh, uh, Khaled did have some blood pressure issues. So what? Everybody that has blood pressure issues doesn't have a brain aneurysm and die. When you look at some of the things that have been confirmed concerning his untimely demise. We're talking about a man who got sick at his home in the bathroom. And from what I understand, he was laying there in that condition on the bathroom floor for hours and hours. How does something like that happen? Your wife is right in the next room or the next to the next room. I mean, come on. That's suspicious to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how do you all of a sudden fall sick and you fall so sick that you fall unconscious on the bathroom floor and nobody comes to check on you? That's just too suspicious. And then you end up in the hospital. Okay, you're in the hospital, and at a certain time, a decision is made to take you off of life support. Now, I will be more than willing to stand corrected if I'm wrong, but one thing that struck me as quite thoroughly suspicious is before Khaled's body was even cold yet, you know, your body is what, 98.6 degrees? His body was probably 98.5 and a half <laughs> degrees. And the next thing you know, Malik Zulu Shabazz, if I remember correctly, I stand corrected if I don't, you having some press conference with the son of Minister Farrakhan Mustafa, and you talking about the Black Panther Party and the Nation of Islam are one? Really? How did that happen so fast? So... There's so many things about Brother Collins' demise that I find very, 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 very suspicious. Do I buy that he just got sick and died? No. No. There's too much that has transpired since Collins' death that Collins needed to be dead in order to happen. Mm -hmm. His death has paved the way for a lot of things that have happened since his death occurred. Mm -hmm. When you're doubting that bullshit that you've been told, and you need that info, info. sign that up. And watch the lies fold Then you can let the truth flow Sanera TV Sanera TV When you feel that melanin about to explode Like you feel the wind blow It's Sanera TV Sanera TV I know you got the truth But you can get more So you continue to grow Sanera TV Sanera